So, uh, Lisa, why did you want to make this movie? I'm sure everyone's been asking you this, but... Well, I was just so interested in the cafeteria as a dining format, but when I learned about the automat and continued to realize how, you know, amazing on top of amazing on top of amazing of a place it was, it really was such a special place. It blew my mind that somebody hadn't already made a film about it. And, you know, I wasn't planning on making a big, huge film like this. I just, you know, I was curious and I wanted to know more. And, you know, it was a, it was a, a fun kind of pet project of mine that got like out of control. <laughs> One of the things that I love that you address in this film is an idea that I've always thought about Disney, uh, which was that Disney to me, Walt Disney World, was a place that was kind of special because uh, very wealthy people go there, but also um, all kinds of people go there, and they mingle together. It's, there's not too many places where you can do that, and you really kind of caught on to that idea in terms of the automat. Uh, when did you realize that that was an idea that you wanted to explore? Well, it definitely wasn't in the very, very beginning, because in the very beginning, I was just like, wow, it's so, you know, glamorous and, you know, kitschy. But over time, I, you know, realized this is a place of historical significance, and I realized there was this incredible social component, and that's, I think, part of why the film really resonates with people. It was this it was a force of a melting pot that we don't have today, and there's absolutely nothing like it. You have a lot of very famous and powerful people in this film. Can you explain a little bit about how you were able to get these people to participate in this film? Uh, particularly Mel Brooks, let's start with him. <laughs> so I was a 35 millimeter projectionist at this movie theater, and we had a lot of guests coming through the theater because we were interested in, you know, showing, you know, retrospectives and new films. And one of the guests was a screenwriter named Carl Gottlieb, and we were showing a film that he had written called Jaws 3D, and we were projecting it on two 35 millimeter projectionists projectors going at an angle like this. It was 35 millimeter and. Uh, it, it was a very it was a very cool event, and I was sort of his guest liaison. I was driving him around, and we became Facebook friends after this event. And he saw my Kickstarter campaign pop up into his Facebook news feed, and he sent me a Facebook message. I had no idea you were a filmmaker, and you were making a documentary about the Automat. It was such an important place for me when I lived in New York. I'm having dinner with my friend Mel Brooks tonight. Do you mind if I mention your project to him? And so he told Mel at this dinner, and then the next day I was in touch with Mel's assistant and we were organizing the shoot because Mel was like very excited that I was making this film and he would, wanted to be a part of it. And he said, we gotta get Carl Reiner involved. So just shortly after that, I, I flew to LA. I was living in Seattle at the time and you know, we filmed Mel and uh, Carl you know, on, at Carl's house. When he got involved, uh, did he do more than just the interviews, um, besides getting some other people to agree to be in it? Was he involved in the production of the film, or fundraising, or anything along those lines? It was pretty much getting Carl Reiner, and then the song, because Mel had asked me, what else can I do for you? And, you know, the, the obvious thing is, you know, I need money, but like, that is not the thing that you say when, you know, a celebrity is offering help. Yeah, I mean, don't do that. So, you know, I said, I'd like a song. I, I have this, you know, dream that we're going to have a new song about the Automat. I knew that I didn't want to spend the money to license Let's Have Another Cup of Coffee, the Irving Berlin song. I was interested in having a new song. And I suggested to Mel that I have a song written, he could approve it, and then we record it. You know, I'll make it really easy for you, Mel. And you know, he said, sure, sure. But then he called me back a couple of weeks later and he said, you know, I think I have something, Lisa. And he started singing to me over the phone. And then he called me back a couple of weeks later and he had, he had written more of the song and he sang that to me. And he pretty soon had finished the whole song and so, 
I had to, you know, get a an or, a temp or, temp orchestra track for him because I wanted to wait until we had all of the the score ready to record everything on the same day. So we had a temp, you know, with like electronic instruments made up for him so that he could, because he he wrote the lyrics and he wrote the you know the sheet music, but I had to then provide him with the music so that he could go into a studio to record it. And then he did that. And then COVID happened. And then finally, you know, right before the Telluride Film Festival in September, we, Seattle had opened enough because I live in New York now, but my, a lot of my team was still in Seattle, including the composer of the film, who is Mel's composer. He composed, Hummy Man composed Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and Dracula Dead and Loving, and also was my neighbor in Seattle, very small world. And then, it was amazing, like the Seattle had been closed, you could not record an orchestra, but Seattle finally got to that phase of reopening where you could, you know, social, you know, you, you, there was no, social gatherings were like, you know, prohibited everywhere, and we were afraid we were gonna have to premiere the film without a, without music. But just in the nick of time, Seattle reopened, we recorded the score, we finally got the like, real, real music players, like to, to replace the electronic instruments. So that was a real relief. The music is really incredible, and, and not every documentary can afford to have a real score like that. Um, tell, but tell me but I will say, you know, a lot of documentaries, they spend a lot of money on um, licensing music, and that's true, yeah. probably, I, I don't exactly, it's my first doc, so I'm, I'm really not sure, but if you were like a doc and you wanted to license maybe a couple of pop, popular songs, I really don't know what that would cost, but it can't be, you know, that much more, I think, to do an orchestra on the cheap, which is what I did. And, you know, I'm, it was always part of my vision. I knew we had all of these like TCM movies. It was, we were gonna have all these old Hollywood movies in the film. I really wanted to have this old Hollywood sound to go with the film. I wanted an orchestra and it's, it's unusual and it, it works for us really well. And, you know, people don't usually talk about the music when they see this film, but we have such high quality music especially for a low budget, you know, especially for a historical documentary. You know, it's, it's unusual, but, you know, it's, you know, it's also kind of unusual, I'd say, for, for a film that starts in 1888, mm -hmm. to then have, you know, all the, the Supreme Court Justice and a former Secretary of State and Mel Brooks, it's, you know, it's also unusual. So we're very unusual and we're proud of it. <laughs> Well, it really helps to create the, the, the mood, the tone of the film. And I was wondering, like, what did you communicate to the uh, composer in terms of um, like the sentiment that you wanted expressed? Well, we talked about the kind of genre that we were going for, and we like bounced ideas back off each other. And we knew Mel, Mel, Mel had written his song. So we, we knew, and I didn't say Mel, I want a song in the great, great America, great American songbook style. But that's what he ended up writing, and that was correct because that's what Irving Berlin would have been. And so we sort of had that as like a, that was the first piece of music that was written for the film, that song. And the kind of genre that Hummy, our composer, refers to the rest of the score as is gentleman swing. And, you know, it's, it, it, it just makes sense. And I had done, when we arrived here today, the kids were like rehearsing a musical. When I was a kid, I was, that was my after school activity in musical theater. And so, right. you know, we were, he, anyways, I, you know, I've kind of heard a lot of the, like Great American Songbook. I was very famil familiar with it. I liked that genre right. a lot. And I, you know, with, when, with Mel's song, the way that it kind of got done was Mel did a lot of takes of that song and I went through every take and I picked out each phrase or syllable that I liked and we pieced it together. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a big project, but it was, you know, it was exciting. And, you know, yeah, I hate to break it to you, but when you hear like a song on the radio, it's not all one take. <laughs> I'm sure uh, you don't always talk about music, but I'm sure everyone's talking about the food with you. Um, Everyone talked about their favorites. Uh, I, I know you didn't get, get a chance to sample the food. If you could go back in time, what, what are the things that you heard about that seem to be the types that you would love to go back and try? 
it sounds cliche, but you know, I love macaroni and cheese with lactate and uh -huh. cream spinach and baked beans. I would have liked to try the mashed potatoes. Although no one really talks about mashed potatoes with the automatic. Did anyone have the mashed potatoes? Were they good? They were very good. Did they serve them with gravy? Don't remember. No, no, no. Okay. And then the pies in moderation because I'm more of like a savory person. People talk about um, how for, for many people, it was the chance to, if you didn't have a lot of money, a chance to go to a restaurant. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, I guess today there's some places like that, but that, that was really one of the key elements to it, the frugality um, that, that people could take advantage of. And um, it, it's so interesting the way that you balanced in this movie, the combination of the history, the business aspect to it, uh, the celebrities, uh, you did a lot in this film and you, and you really put it all together in such an incredible way. How, how did you strike that balance of combining some very serious stuff and just handling it with the right touch to, to make it entertaining for people? Well, I can't take credit for everything. We had such an extraordinary team, although I, I can't take credit for assembling that team, yeah. but I was very particular about who I wanted to work with and I was literally on the waiting list for years to be able to work with my two editors. At first it was me and my friends editing the film, but eventually I got to work with Russ Green and Michael Levine, and these were very experienced documentary editors, and so they had done this before and they kind of understood, you know, there are some rules and some formulas, and also they're much older than I am, and so, you know, Michael, who went to the Automat and who the Automat was a very important place for his parents. He kind of understood it on a level that was maybe even a little bit above my head. And, you know, together, you know, me being, we're di different generations. We kind of, we were a great team together. And I'm very proud of the way that this is a film about something, in the end, greater than just the Automat. You know, it's about, you know, an era that's gone. It's about, America as it was then, and then it's kind of a, like, you know, not only a love letter to the past, but it's sort of like it leaves the door open for, you know, what kind of future do we want for ourselves? And I'm really proud that the film poses, you know, without without literally doing it, it just kind of, it's very subtle, but it, it makes you wonder that when, when you leave. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that while I don't think that the automat literally can come back, I do think that, or I hope, and I believe that some of these values that were intrinsic to the automat, that they are gonna make a comeback. And I believe that they're, they're, in, in, they're in you, like Steve said, who went there, you haven't forgotten them. And you know, the film reminded you of, of these things, but you know, we've, we've gotta keep doing, businesses have to keep doing things for their customers that are good for them. We have to have affordable things that are you know, wonderful and people have to be kind to each other and that sort of stuff is timeless. There's been so many negative things in the last couple of years with COVID and, and now with the war going on and some people are very concerned about the dollar and the economy. Um, in many ways, the decline of the automat, even though it was many years ago, some people might say that, that this is the story of America to maybe in decline. I hope it's not. You seem optimistic, but is this the story, do you think, in some way, also of America, like of a, a time that's disappearing, the decline of the middle class, or don't just see it that way necessarily? Well, for sure it's the story of America in the 20th century, but I, like you say, I'm, I'm very optimistic, and um, it, this film can do one thing. For me, it's putting positivity out there and reminding people of something that's wonderful and inspiring people that we can do it again and that every one of us can be like an automat. It, it, was, such an, it was such an amazing place and you know, we just, we can't forget it and we can make, we can make the world the way we want it to. And what makes me think of it also a little bit is like the Starbucks aspect because uh, he was inspired by Starbucks and the magic of the, uh, of the automat. 
But Starbucks has been very anti-union, for instance, and the, one of the things that you emphasize in the film is how decently they treated the employees. Uh, You're getting was, on my no list with your questions. <laughs> well, explain. <laughs> Okay, well, the, the film doesn't take a position, you know, one way or another on whether Starbucks is good or bad. I'm not but saying that they're bad, but, but they have been very public against uh, unions. And, you, and, you made and neither, point. I'm not for or against unions in this film either, but, you know, whether you like it or not, Starbucks, which is one of the largest food and beverage companies in the world, yeah. it's, you know, interim CEO, it's, you know, it's chairman of the board. He says that this was one of his inspirations for going into the, the food business. Yeah. And so that is an example of how the automat lives on today. And again, it doesn't matter to me if you like Starbucks or not, but it is a place where you can spend $6 on a cup of coffee and you can sit there and use the internet all day in a comfy chair. And Hopefully they don't kick you out. It's happened. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the modern day cafe is one of the best, whether it's Starbucks or another cafe, a, a mom and pop, that's one of the examples of how, you know, where do we see, you know, the automat today? It's in cafe culture. I agree with you. And, and, and one of the ideas I think that you make that's very good is that one of the things that they could do in um, this, business model that they had is they had the ability because of the scale of what they were doing to bring greatness to everyday people and that's something that corporations like Starbucks can do today uh, which sometimes people don't appreciate absolutely and I think while it's sort of hard for us to digest this idea of a cup of coffee today costing so much money I do I don't quite, it's sort of, it's a little frustrating for me because I, people don't seem to understand. I think their business model is not food there. Their business model is coffee. And if your whole business model is going to be coffee, you can't charge five cents for your cup of coffee, you know? But I also don't think that, you know, I'm, you know, I believe in the distribution of wealth and I don't believe that the goal to be successful today needs, the goal isn't to be a billionaire. I love how Horn and Hardart, their success model, it was two cities. Today, the success model is global domination. <laughs> but the whole world has changed. But I think it was beautiful that they were hugely successful in two cities, and that was enough. And it kind of gives everybody else a chance, too, to also, you know, be successful. But, you know, how can we go backwards? You, Everything has changed. That's true. And I know some people have some questions, but it was remarkable um, that you got Colin Powell and, and Ruth in the film. Tell us a little bit about uh, how that came to be. So people wouldn't even expect that. I didn't know for a fact that either of them were customers. I had seen Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the documentary Sturgeon Queens about Russ and Daughters. And she was so great in that documentary, gave me the idea, well, if she ate at Russ and Daughters, she probably also ate at Horn and Hard Art. And so I just sent a letter in the mail to the US Supreme Court, and I put her name on it. Seriously, that's how you did it? Yes, that's and she sent, she sent me a letter back in the mail. And Colin Powell, I had found his name on a Wikipedia list of famous people from New York. And I went through this list with a highlighter, and I thought he would be great. And he also was of the right generation. Chances were he ate there because everybody did. And so I sent him a letter in the mail to his fan mail address. And he also sent me a letter back in the mail. And they both said the same thing. I have very fond memories of going to the automat, but I don't think I would have enough to say to make it worth your while to come out to DC. And so I wrote both of them back saying, even if you have just a sentence to say, it would make a huge impact on the film. And and then they said, oh, well, okay. And I, at this point, you know, we switched over to email and phone. Well, I was 
close to sealing the deal and then I kind of just said, well, I'm coming to DC to interview Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I'm coming to DC to interview Colin Powell, and then that was how we got everything. Once they heard the other one was gonna be in the film, it was possible, so I interviewed him on a Thursday and her on a Friday. I have to give you credit, I mean, um, it's amazing. I mean, just as inspiring as the, the, the story in the movie uh, is, for people that are into filmmaking, what you pulled off in this film and the people that you brought along for this journey, I mean, it, it's amazing. Uh, and I think you're going to inspire a lot of other filmmakers. Well done. So if there's anyone out there that would like to ask some questions, um, I don't know if you need one of these microphones or if you have an extra one. Anybody have any questions? Raise your hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you for a very delightful film. Totally enjoyed it. Uh, actually, I have two questions. One, the opening scene was Ellenville, where all the stuff was kept. How did that ever happen? Why Ellenville? So Steve Stolman, who's the automat collector in the movie, he had moved a lot of his architecturals because he was an architecturals dealer and he used to have a store where he would sell all this stuff in Manhattan. He moved it to sort of near where he lived in upstate New York. He doesn't live in Ellenville, but Ellenville's close enough to where he lives and he has this barn there. And that's where, that was our very first day of shooting the film. And so it was a bit of a shock because I was expecting to see his collection of automats and obviously, you know, everything's are rust, they're all rusty, they're on the ground, it's not temperature controlled. To answer your question. The second question I had, I don't remember as a kid, maybe because I was so fascinated with machinery, there being an option of live service. Was that at all the horn audits? So, um, all of the automats also had a steam table where you would have somebody, you know, you'd go through the cafeteria line and they'd, they'd serve you. Some of the locations were, you know, restaurants, but as far as I'm aware, there weren't any locations that were just all strictly automat. They all at least had a steam table. Is that how you all recall it? No, what do you recall? Never saw a steam table. You only saw the windows. You only saw the windows. Which which location was this? Was it? But was it forty second and third? The last automat. Forty second and third had a steam table. Because I've seen pictures of forty second and third that definitely had a steam table, or you know, just the desserts were behind. You know, you'd have a, like a woman behind the counter in uniform and she'd be putting your dessert on a plate for you. Well, and I'm relieved that you said that because I had had in my memory that my dad got the stuff at the steam table, but my siblings and I loved the windows and I thought I must have been confused. So I probably am confused, but at least there were actually stores there. So the ones that I remember had a steam table, but that's what my dad had. Well, the machines, particularly, you know, towards the end, they they were a gimmick, like the like the movie said that they weren't. It, it's not that they were so functional, but it was that they were, you know, well, they were a not by the end they were a nod to the past, and by by the beginning at the beginning they were just something completely different, and it was you know technology for the first time in a restaurant environment. It was exciting. Questions? Any other questions? Here we go. I would be very interested in if there's going to be a DVD of just what we've witnessed. Are you going to sell them you know, in large quantities? 
So the DVD is scheduled to come out in July from Kino Lorber. You can buy it on their website. Thank you. Yeah, but the film will become available in the iTunes store on June 3rd. For anybody, right now it's a little bit difficult to watch the film online because we're focused on showing in theaters or in virtual film festivals, but June 3rd in the iTunes store or on pay-per-view channels. We've been contacted by, um, you know, a, a, about a possible soundtrack. So it's not, it's not out of the question, but, you know, it's a little bit of a long shot. Very few films, you know, a small film to get like a soundtrack deal. It's, it's, a, it's a bit rare. So they said at the beginning that the automats really started in Europe. And I've certainly been to one in Japan. So I wonder, did you look into anything about the status of automats in the rest of the world? I definitely did not get into automats in the rest of the world. I'm well aware that the chain FIBO, which is in the Netherlands, is very much you know thriving. Although that's sort of a, it's not a place where you go and sit. It's a place where you you know you get your food and you take it home and there are these 24 hour vending machines with like fresh food in them. So it's very different. But you know, wherever the the example that people give me the most today, like, oh, you know, I've been to an automat in Europe, and it's usually that chain FIBO in the Netherlands. Well, two things. Uh, shout out shout out to the So uh, the first thing he said, in case you couldn't hear, was a shout out to the Union Square Automat location, which is where his father worked. And then the second question was, where did I go to school or where am I from? But I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, and our cafeteria there was called The Greenery. But I was born and raised in Los Angeles. So you admit that? <laughs> Well, now I live on the Upper West Side. <laughs> Any other questions? Got one over here. Thank you. Okay, well, it's, here you go. You have this one. Yes, it will. Yeah, first, first, I just want to commend you. It's, it's, it's a great movie. Um, you know, I, I have dim memories of The Automat. My, you, I, I went with my dad a couple of times when I was really, really young. But your film captures that magical memory that I had. It was like, you know, I would, I would tell my friends when I was a kid, and they would just say, no, that, it's impossible. They said, no, they had food. You just like grab the food, it was amazing. But what I, what I was curious to ask, uh, well, two things, really. Uh, one, you might not want to answer for whatever reason, and that's what was the total budget of this? And the other question I have is, um, what are, you, are you working on anything now? I know this was your first film. It took a long time to make, um, but it's, it, I would love to see more of your work. If you're interested in talking about fundraising or the budget, I will, you know, I'll be here for a little bit afterwards and I'd be happy to speak with you. And then in terms of my next project, it's actually a romantic comedy. And it's in the vein of my big fat Greek wedding, except about Italians. And it takes place in Italy, but it's all in English. And aside from cafeterias and Horn and Harder, which I love very much, I also, I speak Italian conversationally and I was working for an Italian company for the last three years, and I also love Italy, so. I'm a woman of many interests. <laughs> Thank you. We have one last question. Hey, if that's it, um, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I hope you can make it next week. It's really an entertaining, very, interesting and fun film and they're not too difficult to look at either the members of the band and also the ukrainian 
fundraiser. And don't forget to vote. Uh, don't forget to hand in your audience ballot. And again, thank you and safe home, everybody.